afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series. We're also very happy you've joined us today. We would like to begin by first acknowledging that the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging is located and our work is done on unceded Indigenous lands. The Ganyankahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Chiatiake, commonly known as Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many Indigenous peoples. Today, it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future and our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples we serve within the Montreal community. In 2007, the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, or the MCSA Education Committee, started the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series in order to suggest practical steps to both improve and maintain brain health as well as to promote healthy lifestyle choices amongst the most populous generation in history. The MCSA Education Committee, which was founded in 1996, has three main objectives. Identifying education needs of healthcare providers, seniors, caregivers, and the public, and to develop responses to meet some of their needs. To enhance the positive image of the aging process by addressing stereotypes and myths about aging. And finally, the dissemination of research on aging. Today's event is in collaboration with the Italian Canadian Community Services of Quebec. Our presenters today are Dora and Michelle. Dora is a graduate student at McGill University where she is pursuing her master's degree in dietetics. She has completed her undergraduate in nutrition and dietetics at Brescia University College. She has a passion for food and cooking and is fascinated about the role cultural differences play in cuisine. Michelle is a graduate student at McGill University where she's pursuing her master's degree in nutrition. She graduated from the nutrition program at Rutgers University in the U.S., where she researched food insecurity in vulnerable populations. Outside of school, she enjoys painting and digital arts. Before continuing, we would like to remind you to please mute your microphone on Zoom, and that if you have any questions, you can either write them down in the chat box on Zoom or wait until the end of the event to ask them. And now I'd like to invite Dora and Michelle to start their presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Dora, and today me and my colleague Michelle will be delivering this presentation on osteoporosis, protein, and calcium. Here is our agenda today, so mainly divided in three parts, osteoporosis, bone health, nutrient, which we will introduce calcium, pro uh, vitamin D, and protein. And we also have three food demonstration videos in the presentation. So by the end of presentation, we hope you, that you can have a better understanding of what is osteoporosis and you know what are the calcium, vitamin D, protein, as well as what are the um, food sources of these three nutrients you can find at the grocery store. And in the end, we hope you will enjoy the, the three high calcium, high protein recipes that we have developed for you guys. So before we start the presentation, I have a data I want to show you. So Osteoporosis Canada reported that over 2.3 million Canadians are living with osteoporosis. Um, what do you think? Like first I was stunned by not looking at this number because osteoporosis in my mind is not a popular chronic disease like cardiovascular disease, diabetes or, so, uh, or obesity, but we have this huge number. So um, why, why so many Canadians are having that? Well, let's find out in the presentation. So um, osteoporosis, by looking at the picture on left, we can see the difference between the normal bone and osteoporosis. So um, in osteoporosis, bone become thin and brittle so we can see the bone bridge there either become thinner or disappeared and we have a lot of holes so the adjective for this is sponge-like so this sponge-like structure is caused by the loss of bone strands or bone density and because of this sponge-like bone structures uh, people with osteoporosis they have higher risk of uh, frag of fragility st bone structures bone fractures, so they have higher risk of broken bones in hips, spines, wrists, and shoulders. It's just because their bones become more fragile to break. 
And uh, here we have a question for you. So osteoporosis only starts in adults 65 years old or more. It is a true or false. Please type your answer in the chat box. Okay, I see a lot of false. So it is true. So um, your bone are strongest around 30 years old. And we can see on the picture here. So um, as we age, as we age, the bone remodeling process, so the bone formation and the bone reabsorption process become less effective. So this age-related bone loss will increase our risk of developing osteoporosis. So it is very important for us to fill in our bone, our bone bank at um, the adolescence. And, when, and one, one interesting factor I want to share with you guys is that osteoporosis can actually strike anyone and any age, even adolescents and children can have it. So it is very important for us to fill in our bone bank along the way, especially uh, in adolescence. And we can see here that men lose some bone mass as their age, as well as for women. And we can see this curve is more uh, steep in women because there are three reasons for it. So the first, uh, women naturally, they have less bone mass to lose than their male pairs. And secondly, usually women, they live longer than male. So, uh, so, they, um, so they will lose so they have longer period to lose the bone mass. And third, women will go through a normal uh, physical phenomenon called the menopause. So during the menopause, they will lose the sex hormone um, estrogen, which is a bone protecting hormone. So we can see from the previous picture that bone uh, men also lose some bone mass. So here is our question. Do male get osteoporosis as well? Have they lose enough bone mass to get osteoporosis? It is a yes or no question. Yeah, I see some yes. So congrats, it is a yes. So um, uh, one in five men will have um, fractures from osteoporosis. And in Canada, 20 to 30% of osteoporotic bone fracture actually happen in men. And one more thing is that usually men, um, uh, more men are, um, than women are die, will, will die uh, because of a hip fracture. Most of them will die within the following years of having hip fractures. And males, they will, they will likely to need more long-term care that woman from a hip fracture. So here's another question for you. It, it is easy to tell if I have osteoporosis. It is a true or false? You guys are correct. It is a false. Osteoporosis is asymptomatic, so it is called the silent death. Just literally, the, it literally uh, steals our bone mass um, without giving any signs or symptoms over a number of years until a bone fracture happens. So often the first warning sign is a fracture. Okay. And uh, is there any way we can detect osteoporosis earlier? There is a medical test called bone mineral density test. It is painless and non-invasive. So this medical test can tell you if you have osteoporosis already or at the risk of developing it. So in com uh, this, this test usually used in combination with other clinical risk factors. So it can help uh, de determine your fracture risk as well as help your physician in deciding which treatment option is more appropriate for yourself. Therefore, this medical test is recommended for all women and men 65 plus postmenopause women of any age because they're losing the bone, 
from protecting hormone estrogen. And men, 50 to 64, with risk factors. And even younger men and women uh, under 50 with disease or conditions associated with low bone density already. So um, here is a continuum of uh, the bone mineral density test. And uh, we can see on the left is normal bone. And in the middle is the osteopenia. And on the, on the right is the osteoporosis. So this, um, so the results of bone mineral density tests usually read in the T-scores, so the standard deviation. So we can start from the left. If you have a minus one standard deviation or more from the bone mineral density test, it means you have normal bone. If you have minus one to minus, minus 2.5 standard deviation, it means you have osteopenia. Should we, um, one thing to notice here is that osteopenia is very different from osteoporosis. Osteopenia is not a disease. It's just a state of low, uh, low bone mass and is usually another early sign of osteoporosis, just like bone fracture. And in the end, if you have point more than um, 0.2.5 standard deviation or less, you have osteoporosis. It, it is actually a bone disease characterized by low bone mass and deterioration of bone tissue, which can uh, lead to increased risk of fractures. It's just because your bones are not stronger anymore. Okay, so um, so far scientists haven't identified any one single cause of osteoporosis. They have identified several risk factors of osteoporosis, just like other chronic disease. So um, here we have listed 12 risk factors from osteoporosis Canada, and we have identified them into modifiable and non-modifiable groups. So modifiable, calcium intake, vitamin D intake, physical activity, exercise, smoking, and alcohol consumption. So if we don't have um, enough calcium and vitamin D intake from our food, we just have weaker bones because we need calcium and vitamin D to help us building stronger bones. So physical activity, exercise. Physical activity can actually help um, protecting our spine. So we uh, protect our spine bones, lower our rate of bone loss as well as it can, can build muscles. So can prevent our, uh, can prevent us from falls. Smoking and alcohol consumption. So if you drink more than three alcoholic drinks per day, be careful about the, um, about the time frame. It's more than three drinks per day. Here, then you will have increased risk of developing osteoporosis. Other than that, increased if you drink a lot of alcohol every day, then you will also have increased risk of falls. So the non-modifiable risk factors including the age. As we age, the bone remodeling process become less effective. So we just, as we age, we just start to lose more bone mass. The sex, women are, um, women are prone to develop osteoporosis than men because they live longer, so they lose more bones. Uh, they have lower um, bone mass in the beginning to lose, and they have that menopause. So they will lose the bone protecting hormone estrogen. Height loss, family history, history of falls, medical uh, medical history, and medical medications. So uh, we have a new 2023 alcohol and uh, health guidelines. It shows a continuum risk of alcohol related harms. So for ad healthy adults. If you drink two drinks or less per week, then you are having a low risk of developing alcohol-related harm. If you drink three to six drinks per week, you are at moderate risk. If you drink more than six drinks per week, then you are at high risk. To be, uh, to be aware, the time frame here is per week. But before, in, if you drink more than three drinks per day, it, you, you are increasing your risk of developing osteoporosis. But if you want to avoid any alcohol-related harms, it is recommended you drink 
two drinks or less per week. Speaking of alcohol drinks, so here is a graph showing what is the standard alcohol drink in Canada. So in Canada, for a bottle of beer, 12 ounces, with 5% alcohol content is considered as a standard drink. And for cider or cooler, 12 ounces, one can, with 5% alcohol content is considered a standard alcoholic drink. For wine, here is the, the measuring is different, is one glass, five ounces with 12% alcohol content of wine is considered as one serving. And for distilled alcohols like rye, gin, rum, one shot glass, which is 1.5 ounces with 40% alcohol content is considered as one serving. So with this graph showing the difference, showing you what is standard drink, I have one question for you. So how many por portions are in one bottle of wine? The bottle here is 750 millimeters. So how many portions are in one bottle, seven, 750 milliliters of wine? Remember one serving is five ounces, a glass. You can put your gas in there. So we have four, five, any more guesses? Six, five. Okay, so more people, so more people are between the five and six. So you're saying per one bottle, 750 milliliters of wine, we have five or six servings. Here we are. Here's the answer. So per 750 milliliter bottle, we have five servings, so five glasses of wine. And be careful, it is wine with 12% alcohol content. If you are drinking a wine with higher alcohol content, the servings will be decreased, okay? And we now we have talked a lot about osteoporosis, what it is, what are the risk factors, and what's this? Um, and um, what's the? How is the alcohol consumption related to uh, osteoporosis? So it is appropriate for us, for me to ask this question: What can you do to prevent bone fractures? Think about the risk uh, factors we have discussed before. Any guesses? We have one, get more exercise. Yeah, exercise can help lower our bone loss rate, increasing calcium and vitamin D intake from food, eat better, <laughs> eat calcium rich foods. Yeah, I'm glad. So here is some are some examples, but you can think of more. So in order to prevent bone fractures and lower our risk of developing osteoporosis, we can try to consume more calcium and vitamin D from foods. We can eat more protein. We can limit our alcohol drinks. So for, if you want to avoid, if you want to low, reduce your risk of developing osteoporosis, drink less than three drinks per day. Three drinks per day. If you want to, um, if you want to avoid the risk of any alcohol-related harms, it's recommended to drink two drinks per or less per week, okay? And also for uh, do more exercise and avoid smoking. If you don't smoke, then don't even start it. So we have talked about that calcium has very, is very important in our bone health, but why is calcium so important? So it is the most abundant mineral in the body. We actually have a bank in our body. So 98% of calcium is stored in bones. And calcium, it, it makes up our bones, our teeth, and it allows for normal body movements. So if, if we don't get enough calcium and vitamin D from our foods, our body will rub the back. We'll, so our body will take the calcium for our bones for the normal um, body regulations. And if we don't take 
we and if we don't refill our calcium bone, uh, calcium back our bones, that our bones will become weaker and weaker. And one thing more is that our the net absorption of dietary calcium decreases as people age. So here, uh, it sh it shows the importance again to that we need to fill our calcium bank, need to fill our bone back where uh, from adolescence where we still have the um, really strong dietary calcium absorption. So speaking of that, uh, where can you find calcium? Which food? We can use the Canada Food Guide food plate on the left to, to guide us. Which food groups are rich in calcium? Happy your Type your guesses in the chat box. Dairy product. I see some cheese. Any more guesses? Dairies, eggs, protein. Nuts. Okay, I see some new answers. Green veggies. Okay. Um, so dairy is usually what comes to people's mind. Like on the picture here, we can see the milk, the yogurt, and a variety of cheese. But we also have some dairy-free options for people who don't like to, who can't, or who don't like to consume dairy products. Here is just some, some examples. So we have almonds. We have canned fish with bones, especially with bones. Bones here has been um, processed safe for people to chew and swallow. Some leafy veggies. Someone mentioned green veggies before. But careful, only certain veggies are rich in calcium, like spinach and kale and beans, like edamame and tofu made with calcium sulfate. So one thing here is some people will ask, is soybean also rich in calcium? We know that it's, it is rich in protein. The answer for that is here, the uh, edamame is actually the immature green soybeans. So for people who don't like to, to eat edamame, the soybean is also a good um, source of calcium. And we also have some fortified beverage, like here is a picture of orange juice. It, on the label, it says calcium fortified. And some soy milk has also been fortified with calcium. So it just means extra calcium has been added to the orange juice, has been added to the soy, bean, soy milk to, uh, to have more calcium during the food processing. So how much calcium do we need? As we know, calcium is very important, but we don't want to take too much calcium because too much uh, calcium and vitamin D can have some side effects on ourselves. So for men, 50 to 70 is 1,000 milligram calcium per day. For women, 50 to 70 is 1,200 milligram calcium per day because they're going through the menopause. And for men and women, um, for anyone 71 years old or more is 1,200 milligram calcium per day. And we recommend take calcium and vitamin D from foods. And if you can't meet this requirement, we recommend uh, we suggest you discussing it with your physician. So the vitamin D, the vitamin D is a fundamental for bone health as well. It can help us absorb and use calcium so we can um, build stronger bones and vitamin D also increase our muscle strength. So where can we find vitamin D in foods? Take some guesses. Also, feel free to use, uh, just unmute yourself and say your answer if you don't, if you don't want to type. You don't have to always type. Okay. Any guesses? Milk? Milk. Protein? Milk dairy fruits? Whole grains? Okay, we see a lot of dairy here. So here are some food sources of vitamin D. Egg yolk soft margarine, salmon, unsweetened milk, and unsweetened plant-based uh, milk, like uh, almond milk or soy milk. But usually we recommend um, to take soy milk because it has higher protein content. 
And uh, labels can help us your identify the first sources of vitamin D and calcium. So we have four things to look at. The serving size, here is one cup. The, the new food label regulations have standardized the serving size of similar foods and the calorie. So per one cup, we are serving 140 calories. And uh, we can also look at the daily percentage here. It is the reference amount of nutrient to consume on each day. And it has a note here, so 5% or less daily, percent, daily percentage is a little, 15% or more is a lot. And also here we have a list of nutrients, including vitamins and minerals here. So as many people say, milk is, 40, milk is rich in vitamin D because Canada's law requires cow's milk to be fortified with vitamin D. We can see here that uh, vitamin D from a milk is 30%. So it means a lot because it's more than 15%. Okay, so one more question for you. Is cheese a good source of vitamin D? And feel, yes. free, to, feel free to unmute yourself if you want. Oh, we have a yes or no here. It's tricky. So usually no. Unlike milk, cheese is not required to be fortified with vitamin D. Like we can see here, vitamin D, zero, zero percent. But, but cheese still remains a good source of calcium and protein. Same with yogurt, no vitamin D, as we can see, is not even on the full label. But there are some exceptions, like very few yogurts are fortified with vitamin D. Like here, calcium, vitamin D. But it's always recommended to check the label to see how, how many um, vitamin D has been added, like is a little or a lot. So vitamin D supplement, um, vitamin D is unique because our body, our sun can make it under the sun exposure, but it's, it has been impacted um, by several factors like seasons, time of the day, limited outdoor time, age, and amount of skin exposure exposed to sun. Because we're in Canada, like half of the year is winter. So Health Canada recommends us to take 400 IU vitamin D per day. It, uh, it's recommended to take it from foods, like um, fortified products. But if you can't, then you can, it's recommended to take from supplements. All right. So now that we've covered a lot of vitamin D and calcium, we wanted to bring you a few recipes that you guys could use at home so you can uh, use some of the knowledge that you're learning from today. So the first one is this Canadian cheddar cheese soup, and it has, it's, it's rich in protein and calcium, uh, has some vitamin D, just, just not that much because, of course, it's, it's just a little bit of milk that we're using. Uh, so let's look at the calcium content of this uh, cheese soup. It has 17% of your daily value. Uh, what do we think? Do we think that, is this a good source? Yes, no. What do we think? Is this a good source of uh, calcium? Uh, you, can, you can type in the chat, yes or no. You can unmute yourself if you want. Yes, okay. A couple of people say yes. Yes, it's a good source. And as Dora said before, if we have, if if uh, the content is over 15%, then we can say that it's a good source for that uh, vitamin or mineral. So in this case, yes, it's a good source of calcium. And now we're gonna see how, uh, how we make this soup. So here's the video uh, that we made for you guys. And the ingredients that you're gonna need is cherry cheese, carrots, butter, onions, milk, water, paprika, dry mustard, uh, flour, and chicken breath. So first we're gonna start prepping the vegetables and uh, you can peel it if you want. I just like to keep the peel on just for some extra fiber. And uh, then for onions, we're using half a cup of onions. If you're an onion person, you can add more or if you don't have that much that day, that's okay, you can use less or you can skip the onions. Uh, and then for the cheese, we're using cheddar cheese. You can buy the pre-shredded one, but we like to shred our cheese because it saves us some money. And then we're using one cup of milk and we're using 3% in this case, but you can use 2%, 1% uh, or other type of uh, vegetarian options. And then we have uh, half a cup of chicken broth just to give it that soup flavor. 
And now we're measuring the flour. We have two tablespoons of flours and we also have two tablespoons of butter. And this is very important to keep these proportions because this is what's gonna give this thickened roux the right consistency. So make sure to keep it two tablespoons of flour and two tablespoons of butter. And now for the herbs and spices, we're using uh, dry mustard and paprika, but definitely feel free to use others that you have at home. Anything that you have, you can use for this recipe. Uh, and then lastly, we just need one cup of water. So we're gonna start by uh, melting the butter that we measure and you can preheat, we just, we just heat it there, but you can preheat it before. Uh, we're gonna start by melting the butter and then we're gonna add the onions and uh, the carrots. And you can uh, brown the onions a little bit, you can cut the carrots until they're soft. But if you like them a little bit more crunchy, you can cook it for a little bit less time. And then once that's all melted and cooked, we're gonna go ahead and add the flour. Uh, and like I said before, make sure to keep the same uh, proportions of flour and butter, because we're gonna make sure that this roux, it's gonna have the right consistency. And you can see here how it start getting uh, just a little bit thicker. And once that's well mixed, we can add the chicken stock, we can add the paprika, the mustard. Once again, if you have other spices at home, feel free to switch it up, be creative, use uh, what you have at your house. Yeah, so here we're adding everything, we're making sure it's all well mixed before we add the rest. And now we can add the milk and the water. Once again, you can use uh, other uh, milks that you have at home and other options if you prefer. And now uh, we're just gonna mix that and make sure that you keep stirring because it has milk so it can get sticky in your, in your pan. So we're just gonna keep mixing that. And then once it's boiled, we're gonna turn off the heat. We're gonna add the cheddar cheese and then we're just gonna uh, keep mixing until the cheddar cheese is all melted. And that's how you know that it's gonna be ready to serve. All right, there you go. That's the final product. And then you can put the garnish of any herbs that you have at home. So any questions about the uh, cheddar cheese soup, uh, you can put it in the chat, you can mute yourself. Uh, it's good said, and tasty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it is really good. Yeah, we try it. Somebody say too much sodium and just, yeah, just make sure they use low sodium cheese, low sodium uh, chicken broth. I think because when, when we did the label, we used the standard, um, the standard ingredients. So make sure to use low sodium ingredients when you do this soup. And now we're gonna talk about protein because I saw earlier when Dora was asking what, what can you do, what kind of nutrients you need? A lot of you say calcium and vitamin D, uh, but I, I don't think anybody say protein and it's very important. Protein it's also it's fundamental for the bones and it gives the bones strength, flexibility, it gives them better mobility. Uh, yeah, up next. And if you have the amount, uh, the right amount of protein in your diet, you're gonna increase the bone mass uh, in your body. And then you're gonna also lower the risk of fractures. Um, yeah, and somebody asked for osteoporosis, should we avoid salt? Well, there is there's not a clear connection between salt and osteoporosis, but just, just in general, we should try to avoid sodium, uh, especially for the senior population because of all the consequences of having sodium in your diet. And then the other questions, does caffeine affect the absorption of calcium and vitamin D? Um, there's definitely some interaction between, between caffeine and, and vitamin D. So yeah, I wouldn't recommend to, to drink that much coffee. Um, but, yeah. I'm just gonna add, um, so caffeine in moderation is fine. Um, and so like two to three cups or so is, is, is fine if it's tolerated well by you. Um, so that's fine. And also too, for sodium, it's trying to have it in moderation. So we do need to, it's okay to have small amounts of sodium in our diet coming from, from that's already in food, but trying to cut back on added salts and, and ultra processed foods will help keep our sodium in line as well. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. All right. So... Now, going back to protein, uh, most people usually, they eat the right amount of protein. We don't, we don't usually see people with a deficiency of protein. It's not common in, at least in Canada. However, there is uh, an issue with seniors that has been reported by Osteoporosis Canada is that uh, a lot of seniors, they do not consume 
an uh, adequate amount of protein. And there can be many reasons for it. There can be a uh, lack of motivation uh, for cooking or just difficulties accessing uh, protein-rich foods, which tend to be a little bit expensive. Uh, sometimes there is changes in appetite. So there is just many reasons why uh, we've seen this issue in seniors that they don't have enough proteins. Uh, so can you go to the next slide? So I'm just gonna ask you before we continue, where can we find protein in foods? What foods do you know that are high in protein? And you can put it in the chat box, you can admit yourself. Meat, yeah. Any other guesses? Yeah, meat, fish, eggs, legumes. Yeah, you're right. All right, so yeah, animal protein sources. Uh, that's what comes to like people's mind. We have fish, meat, eggs, anything that's animal products, for sure, they have a lot of protein. Uh, but then we also have a plant-based protein. I saw a lot of you uh, are aware of this. Yes, we have nuts. We have different legumes, we have uh, peas, beans, there is so many uh, plant-based proteins that we can have. So just, just make sure that you're aware of that, that we can have protein, not just for animal products, but also from uh, vegetables and legumes. And, and I also recommend uh, always follow the Canadian food guides. If you see the plate that is in here, if your plate looks like this with a proportion of vegetables, uh, and animal products, and then you're most likely getting the right amount of protein. So always refer to this plate. It's like it's your best friend uh, to make sure that you're eating a, a healthy, balanced diet. All right. So the next recipe that we made for you is this skillet pasta and spinach, and it has a good amount of protein, and it also has 300 uh, milligrams of calcium. So what do you think? Is this a good source of calcium? Yes, yes or no? You can put it in the chat or mute yourself. What, is, what do you think about the calcium? Yes, mm -hmm. a couple of people say yes. Uh, yeah, you're right. We have 23% of your daily value and anything that's over 15% will be considered a good source uh, of, of that nutrient. So yeah, we have a lot of calcium here. So now we're gonna show you how we did it. Um, the ingredients that you're gonna need are onions, red pepper, celery, frozen spinach, mozzarella cheese, tomato sauce, pasta, ground beef, mushroom. Uh, we have some garlic over there as well, dry oregano and dry basil. So we start by measuring one cup of pasta and we're using pennant pasta, but you can use other type of pasta that you have at home. Uh, feel free to use, you know, just anything that you like. And then we're gonna start boiling the water while we press the vegetables. So while that's boiling, we're gonna start measuring everything. We have uh, the frozen spinach that we uh, thawed out and drained. Then we have the cup of mushrooms that we're using. And some mushrooms do have vitamin D, not all. So make sure to always check the labels. And then for the vegetables, we're using celery, we're using bell peppers, uh, we're using onions. But then once again, if you have other vegetables at home, feel free to, to throw them in there. If you don't like any of these, you like that's that's fine. Just be creative, use what you have in your house. And now for the herbs and spices, we're using dry basil, uh, some garlic, and, and again, feel free to use the herbs and spices that you have at home. For the cheese, we're, we're grating our own cheese. You can buy the bags that are already grated, but uh, that's up, up to you. And now for the preparation, we're gonna start boiling the pasta. And while that's boiling on the side, we're gonna start cooking the meat. So we we'll start by cooking this ground beef. And I like to remove the fat that I recommend you guys to just, just to get rid of that excess fat that comes, uh, especially with ground beef. So we just use a spoon to remove that. And now we're gonna add first the onions and we're gonna cook those until they're brown. Now we're gonna add the red peppers, celery, garlic, mushrooms, uh, once again, feel free to use all our vegetables at home if you have. And we're just going to keep stirring. We want to make sure that none of that uh, gets, to, gets stuck in the pan and like it burns or anything. And then we're going to use the tomato sauce that we have. Uh, make sure you're using a uh, reduced sodium or low sodium tomato sauce because they tend to have a little bit of sodium. And now we're going to simmer that for 10 minutes. And then once that's all well cooked, we're going to add the pasta that was cooking on the side. Uh, we're going to add the spinach, and then we're gonna add the mozzarella cheese. Yeah. So there we're adding the remaining ingredients. Uh, we're gonna add the cheese, 
And then we're just gonna uh, mix that well until the cheese is melted. And that's, that's when you know that it's ready to, to serve. Right. We also added a pinch of salt and pepper, but again, you can do it as, as you like. And now we're gonna top it up with a little bit of cheese, but feel free to use whatever you have at home. Okay. Uh, questions about uh, this, but oh, before, before we do these questions, can you go back to the video there? Question about the pasta, any, anything, any comment, anything that you uh, are curious to know? I think we can move on to the question that I have. All right, so I have a question uh, for you guys. Is it the same to eat all my protein in one meal than eating throughout the day? Is it the same, true or false? What do we think? Um, oh, somebody said, should we should we be using whole wheat pasta? Um, if you want to add some fiber, you can. I will recommend check for your dietitian just because uh, some people have very specific uh, fiber requirements. Uh, but yes, if you have, if you have, if you're okay eating whole wheat pasta, if you can tolerate it, for sure use it. Um, all right. So a lot of answers here. Some people say false. Some people say true, false. And the answer is is false. It's not the same. I wouldn't recommend uh, eat all of your protein just in one meal and then forget about it for the rest of the day because it's it you won't absorb as much protein. So what's recommended is to spread out your protein throughout the day. Uh, I, um, so I want to say maybe 20 to 35 grains of protein for breakfast, then uh, for lunch, and then for dinner. So yeah, just try to spread it out throughout the day because that way you will maximize the absorption. And if you are trying to figure out how much is 20 to 30 grains of protein, uh, you can use this method. It's very simple. If you're using, if you're eating meat, try to eat meat that is the size of the palm of your hand, and that's gonna give you an approximate of three ounces, which which will be twenty five to thirty grains of protein. Um, all right. Once again, I wanna uh, remind you of the Canadian food guide of your plate because if your plate looks like this then again you're most likely eating the adequate amount of protein throughout the day and if your all your meals look like this then uh, you're probably getting uh, what you need so make sure to always refer to this plate all right um can you guys think of any protein rich snacks anything that you like to eat anything that you will be like oh that's that's a good source of protein let me have that you know during the day uh, what what options uh, can you think of? You can put on the chat. You can unmute yourself. Nuts, yeah, nuts are great for protein. Yeah, chickpeas, yeah, yeah, true. All right, so we wanted to show you some options. Peanut butter, that's a great source of protein. You can eat it. Um, with your bread, it's like a very easy thing uh, to consume to increase your protein during the day. You have eggs, you can just boil eggs during the day. If you get hungry, you know they're gonna have enough protein. Uh, you can add cheese into your meals because we know they have protein and it has calcium. And then we also have yogurt, which again, is a great source, not just protein, but also for calcium. And now, um, me so seeds are also really high in protein and calcium uh so we wanted to recommend you some of these seeds uh like sesame seeds chia seeds poppy seeds flax seeds so these are great snacks because they have a lot of nutrients they have protein they have calcium and the one that i wanted to uh, focus on today is chia seeds uh, because they are a considered as a superfood just because of all the amount of nutrients that they have. They have a lot of protein, a lot of calcium, they have fiber, they have antioxidants, and they're also very easy to cook. I've heard that people, some people just like grind it and add it into uh, their pudding, into their meals. So that's a very easy, uh, easy way to cook it. And the recipe that we uh, ham seed, uh, so hemp seed, they, they do have some nutrients. I don't think they're as rich as, as chia seeds. Yes. Yeah, so, hemp seeds are a great source of protein. They don't have um, as much 
calcium, but they're, it's great to vary the different types of seeds that you use. Um, so like the hemp, uh, any of these kinds of things to kind of, to work in. Uh, does chia seeds need to be cooked? Uh, not, not, not like with fire. You can do easily a chia seed, but you don't have to cook them uh, like with fire, you mean? No, you can just put it into your meals and eat it as it is. Um, another question. There's a link between high cholesterol and osteoporosis. Does that have an impact on having certain foods such as cheese? Uh, I... I'm not super knowledgeable in this connection. I am not super sure. Mary, do you, do you know about this, the connection between cholesterol and osteoporosis? Um, I'm, I, I'm honestly not sure if there's a direct link. If people have high cholesterol, if they have osteoporosis, um, I think they're very, they're separate diseases and separate pathways. But if somebody is struggling with issues with having heart disease, then we do recommend using more lower fat foods and making sure that you're working in healthy oils, like olive oils, et cetera. But you can certainly get lots of great calcium from um, skim milk and low fat cheeses, but also to looking at many other options for getting calcium from some of this, uh, the sources that we've spoken about today. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, hopefully answered that question. So we have here the chia seed pudding that we prepare uh, and, and it's not cooked. You're gonna see it one, once we made it, we didn't use any fire for this. And it has, uh, it has some protein, it has calcium, and it has vitamin D. So what do you think, once again, calcium, 300 milligrams, is this a good source of calcium? Uh, what do you think, yes, no? Uh, you can put it in the chat, you can unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. we will say yes. Um, Red eggs daily are not good for you, any comments? I, I think, um, well, I would say to check with your physician or dietitian. Some people can tolerate eggs, uh, but um, I guess for some people, uh, it might not be recommended to have uh, as much. But but I I wouldn't advise against eggs. I don't think there's um, so so. Yeah. Uh so yeah, so eggs um, have gotten a bad rep historically because they've been, they are, they do have higher levels of cholesterol, but from our new understanding that it's, that it's okay to have eggs in moderation. So up to one egg per day or, you know, two to three per week. Um, but they're a great source of protein. They do have some vitamin D in it. Um, so just it, it's moderation. And if you can find eggs that, um, are fed with flax, they actually have omega-3, which is really healthy fat. So that's, there are some ways to get um, a variety of different nutrients by eating eggs in moderation. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we're gonna show you how we made this chia seed pudding. And it's very easy to make. Uh, the ingredients that we have are half a cup of milk, chia seeds, maple syrup, uh, one cup of apricots, and then the tablespoon of vanilla. So we have uh, the milk, we're using 2% milk, and you can use 3%, 1%, you can use chocolate milk, uh, you can use uh, oat uh, milk, I believe. So as the this replacement milk, they can help you also to do this pudding. And then for the toppings, we're using apricots, but you can use other fruits that you have at home. You don't have to just use apricots, use whatever you have at home. And now for the preparation, we're just gonna mix the ingredients in a bowl, we have the maple syrup, we have the vanilla extract, we have the chia seeds, uh, we have the milk, and make sure to follow the proportions that we give you on the recipes, which is uh, two tablespoons for every half a cup of milk. So, so follow those proportions because there is a, a gelifying process here to make the pudding. If you follow those proportions, it's most likely gonna turn out well, but some people like it a little bit more uh, sturdy or a little bit more softer so you can play around that you know, after you try it for the first time. So what we're going to do with this recipe, we're going to mix that all well. We're going to let it sit for 10 minutes and then we're going to mix it again. And then once that's well mixed, we're going to cover it uh, with plastic foil and then we're going to refrigerate it for um, at least an hour. 
but you can refrigerate it the night before. You can just do it the night before and then eat it uh, for breakfast, kind of like overnight oats. So once this is done, we're gonna add our uh, apricots that we cut. But again, feel free to use the fruits that you have at home uh, or anything that you wanna put on top. And there you go. It's very easy to make. We did not use any fire. We just mixed uh, the milk with the pudding and like the maple syrup. All right, any questions about this recipe? So here uh, we come to the last activity of today. So it's a create activity. So uh, we have two pictures. One on the left is omelette for breakfast and one on the right is for skewers. So um, from what have we have discussed today, what can we add to these two dishes to make them higher in calcium, vitamin D and protein content? Uh, feel free to unmute or type in the chat box. We have cheese in the salad, add cheese to the omelette, um, nuts, yogurt with the fruit, yes. Any more ideas? Okay, I think that's it. Here we have some tips. So um, we can add a glass of milk on the side to the omelette, or we can also replace the water with milk when we're mixing the pancake mixing. And for the uh, for the yog Greek yogurt, we can use Greek yogurt to make the dipping sauce. They, they can be both savory and sweet. So for savory, we just blend in some salt, some olive oil and dill. And for sweet, we blend in some maple syrup, a, a vanilla extract. I tried them myself, they're very tasty. And for cheese, we can add a piece of cheese of any kind like here on our toast. So the famous cheese sandwich is uh, is a delicious and quick way to go if you're hungry or on to, um, or on to go. So here are some useful resources of Steel Process Canada, My House Alberta Network, and a food guide, the plate, and Unlock Food Canada. So thank you for listening.